Hello and welcome to Overtime Hockey Talk. My name is Mark Paul and my co-host Justin Baker joining me via Skype. Justin, good evening to you as we record maybe the latest we've ever recorded an episode of Overtime Hockey Talk. Yeah, I would I would say so. Uh quite a busy day and you got you got quite an early morning coming up too yeah party with my acl reconstructive surgery and got to be there at 5 30 in the morning so it's 10 30 right now in in the evening so uh yeah we're gonna we're gonna knock this one out i think a an interesting conversation to have uh, i think a conversation that's been uh, been going on in pieces all throughout this season you know the first half of the season or so i guess we're a little past the the halfway mark uh, but I I don't think I've heard anybody talk about this as just grabbing everything together, putting all the pieces together and really taking a look at this. So what we're going to do on the show is we are going to look at all the upcoming RFAs for, uh, you know, not necessarily for every team, but the most significant ones. Uh, there's a lot of forwards that I'd say are, uh, you know, any anyone significant to me is someone who's going to get more than $4 million a year. You know, we're, we're not going to, I mean, a guy that's going to go and get two and a half, that's, I mean, good for him, but that's not the guys that we're going to target here to, to talk about. Uh, you know, we're obviously, we're talking Mitch Marner and Austin Matthews and Miko Ranton and Braden Point, uh, just to name a few, uh, that these are some of the guys who are coming up and how this is really going to change the landscape of the National Hockey League cap structure and situation uh, for many, many teams. And so, uh, Justin, initial thoughts as you went into this. Yeah. Uh, wow. What a RFA class we got because we got some big some big time names in here too. I mean, you look at it, I, the, the first two names that pop off the board to me are Austin Matthews and Patrick Laine, the number one overall, number two overall in the, the draft there. Uh, those two guys are really looking to get paid, and and then some other guys that just sort of came out of nowhere, like your Braden Points, man. I just, it's going to be exciting to see what some of these guys get paid. And I know, uh, know a few of them. I mean, are really going to shape the way the rest of their team is paid around them. Specifically, I mean, when you when you think of an Austin Matthews, for example, right, uh, the the trickle down effect he's going to have on a guy like maybe Mitch Marner, for example, should be interesting. Yeah, and uh, all this kind of comes. I think maybe the reason why this got us thinking about this is because news broke today. Kyle Dubas saying, uh, general manager of the Leafs, of course, saying that uh, the Leafs and Austin Matthews have made good progress and that they are working on an extension and their hope is to have it done before the trade deadline. So uh, I think that gives them a, I mean, it makes sense. You want to have a, this your biggest deal done before you go out and acquire maybe a defenseman who has term. You know, you need to know what you're working with. So I, I think that it's fair, and, uh, you know, Austin's going to get paid. There's no doubt about that. So, uh, And with that said, let's uh, let's start rolling through some of these names. I think it's only fitting that we start with a guy who has 73 points in 49 games, uh, almost averaging a point and a half per game. Miko Rantanen, right winger for the Colorado Avalanche, of course, playing alongside Nathan McKinnon. And, uh, yeah, where do you think this guy ends up in terms of how much money he's going to make next year? Boy, uh, I mean, it's it's a given. I think a majority of these top-end guys are going to gonna get their eight-year term. But when you, when you talk about money, I, you know, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to pinpoint because, one, he's not a center. So, um, you know, and he plays with a guy like Nathan McKinnon on a line where – you often have that argument like who really drives that line, right? Because obviously Nathan McKinnon already has his, his deal. He's he's locked up for another four years after the season. So they don't have to worry about paying him right away. And when you look at a guy like Miko Rotten, and again, like I said, you know, is he the one really driving this line or is it really Nathan McKinnon? So because Rotten's not a center, do you really want to give him, you know, too much money or more money than you might actually give him because he plays center and drives the line, I guess. Um so for me, boy. I mean, he automatically is going to be the highest paid player on this team because McKinnon no. is locked in for another five years at $6.3 million, which is just absurd. Poor Nathan McKinnon. If he had just signed this deal <laughs> two years later, he'd probably be getting 10 uh, Yeah. But nevertheless, 
it, I mean, you got to look at his production. But yes, yeah, so you're right. The fact that he plays with McKinnon is going to affect this. Uh, and everybody's kind of got to stay. Yeah, I don't think you're going to go pay Ranton and uh, like a uh, ten and a half million. No, no, I don't think so either. And I think, you know, when you look at his production, right? He's he said this. I mean, obviously, this is his coming out season. Last year, eighty four points, eighty one games. That was great. Um, I mean, even even at, that's deserving of at least eight and a half million. Oh, of course. But I mean, you look at the seasons before that, right? He he only had one full season prior to that, and he only put up thirty eight points. And uh, granted, it was on a horrible, horrible Colorado Abs team, the worst um, Avalanche team ever. <laughs> it's, yeah, the worst. So. Um, honestly, for me, I would peg this somewhere around nine, nine and a half million for a guy. Yeah, I think there's a chance that they push it to ten. I, I think Rantanen gets an identical deal to Mitch Marner. I, okay. I think that they're they're very similar. You know, not I know Marner. You know, Marner's got sixty one points in forty eight games. Rantanen has has seventy three. Rantanen's got four more goals than Marner. So I, I think they're very comparable. And you think Marner's playing with Tavares, Rantanen's playing with McKinnon, so their numbers are a little inflated. Uh, but I see, you know, w- the way that some of this is going to play out is Austin Matthews is going to sign first and foremost. You know, that's that's a given. He's a center. You, you know, you're talking about that. He's a center, so you're going to lock him up long term first. Uh, and and Marner's camp has already said they won't negotiate until the off season. So then I think you've got Marner and Rantanen and both of those guys are going to go, well, I mean, I should get it as much as him, right? Like one of those two doesn't want to sign for 8 million and the other guy go and get 10 when they're having very similar seasons playing with similar centers. For sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, obviously the abs are going to make the argument, right? Um, you know, if, if for instance, Ratnan comes back and says, Hey, well, look, Mitch Marner got this. Why can't I get this money? Right. You know, obviously, you can always make the argument. Well, Rottenen sees more ice time, and then of course he can always use that as leverage as well. You you depend on me a little bit more. So uh, this one could be interesting, but I I would agree. I, I I honestly think both these guys coming right around the same number. Yeah, uh, let's uh, let's go to Braden Point, who is another. I mean, sixty five points in forty nine games. He's the second highest scoring player in this class right now for the Lightning, and he has really come into this place where, I mean. It's him and Kucherov, and Stamkos is, I mean, really, he's almost second fiddle at this point to uh, to point and to Kucherov. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's fair. Uh, you know, he is, I mean, just to put it simple, he's he's the coach's favorite at this point, right? He's He gets put out there in every situation, whether that means, you know, defensive draw or, you know, in the offensive zone on top power play minutes. He's, he's the guy that... You know, Mr. Cooper loves to put out there for for any type of minute, and uh, he's certainly going to get paid for it. I mean, granted, he hasn't had this type of point production. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended. Uh, yeah, hasn't had this kind of point per game production uh, his whole entire career. This is sort of you know the big season. I think last year, what he had sixty six points in in a full campaign. Right. Um, right. Yeah. For me, though, I, I think given. You know, the no state tax in Florida uh, and the cap situation that the Lightning are up against, you know, they're going to, I mean, granted, they are losing guys like Strawman, Corburn, Girardi. I, I think maybe one of those guys might stick around, but for less money. However, they're still going to be up against the cap uh, pretty yeah, well, tight. Only because, $6.3 million as of right now available to them for next year. Which, right. Which and isn't enough you, to sign him, right? Right, exactly. Not enough. Yanni Gord's new contract kicking, and I, I do think, and, and Kucherov's new deal kicks in next season, which is going to uh, you know really hurt the type of number she's going to get. But I think you're going to see somebody like you know maybe a Tyler Johnson or uh, Andre Palat. Somebody gets moved, I think, next season to make room for Braden Point to stick around long term. And honestly, I I think you're going to see the same number as Stamkos here. I think eight and a half million is fair for Braden Point. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that I think though the guy who will certainly be looked at moving is going to be Ryan Callahan with only one year left on his deal after the 2018-19 season he seems to be uh, the odd man out he's the second high uh, well next year he'll be the third highest paid player 
out, uh, you know, until Braden Point resigns. So, I mean, he's definitely the guy that needs to go. His, he's relative. We'll say, we'll say in terms of point production, he's relatively useless. And so he, he's just going to be the casualty of a cap hit. As much as you like to keep a, a leadership guy like that around, it's just he, he's just not going to cut it. But, yeah, I, I mean, it, it looks to – if you have to sign a Cedric Paquette and uh, Adam Earn, like, you know, there's other other people that you need to resign as well, as well as figuring out what you're going to do with the rest of your defense. Because you need right. to sign at least two defensemen. Uh, maybe Strawman comes back again. And and signs for just a small raise, uh, but I I don't see Jan- Dan Girardi coming back for you know anything. Uh, Braden Coburn maybe on a on a smaller deal, but uh, yeah, that's I mean this team's going to need to figure out where they're going to spend their money, and chances are one of these forwards is going to have to say bye bye. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let, let's. We'll, you know, and, and I, a team that we haven't talked about much this season, even though they're doing fantastic, we've talked about the team doing fantastic, the Calgary Flames, but uh, we haven't talked much about Matthew Kachuk. Uh, in sp- you know, spent any, a lot of time talking about him on our show. Uh, he is an RFA at the end of the year, fourth highest scoring uh, guy in this class right now, just behind Mitch Marner. He's got 57 points in 50 games, and a player who is. I'd say he came into his own last year, but in terms of production, he's just kind of hit that new that next level that people were hoping. You know, this the brains and the brawn and the and the the talent level and the grit would kind of come together, and he wouldn't just be this twenty goal scorer with fifteen assists, but that he could put it all together. And he has really shown that he is a top line guy. He's not playing on the top line, but he is a you know he's a top six forward and a and a a guy who drives a line. Yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely fair to say. And, I mean, you look at it, too, from another standpoint. Uh, I mean, you go on Cap Friendly, right, and you can clearly see the A listed right next to his name on the, uh, you know, on the, the team page there. And it's it's clear to me that this team really looks to him as, as a future leader, right? Not just a future point getter, but a guy that they hope can be a Sean Monaghan and a, and a Giordano to help lead this team into uh, what hopefully has been their coming out season that they're they're back and ready to start winning winning some playoff rounds here. Yeah, and I mean you got to think you know Mark Giordano, thirty five years old. You know sometime in the next two three years, uh, most likely will be gone from this team, uh, and so you know someone else is going to have to get that captaincy. And and it, maybe it's Monahan, but at the same time, something about Matthew Kachuk that just screams heart. And uh, and I, I think. There is some danger in overpaying for a guy like that uh, because he is so different. I, I'd say that you, when you look at Kachuk, I think more of he is a a rich man's Tom Wilson. Like we say, there's no <laughs> Tom Wilsons in the league anymore. Well, there's there's Matthew Kachuk. Uh, it, the difference is is that Matthew Kachuk can put up a point per game, at least at the, uh, you know right now that's what he's doing. And so I I think that. You know, you think about all right. Tom Wilson got five, so certainly a Matthew Kachuk is getting more than five. When you look at the way the Flames are structured, I mean they're they're in real good shape here. No one's getting paid more than six, seven, five, which Johnny Goodrow and and Giordano both making that for the next four years, and then behind them comes uh, Monahan at six three. So, are you thinking Kachuk's got to get more than Goodrow, right? Well, so one one deal that I think would be a great great starting point here would be uh, Jake Gensel. His recent deal he got from Pittsburgh for five years at six million dollars, right? I think that's a, a perfect starting point for a guy like Matthew Kachuk. I think he he takes a look at the deal and he'll say, hey, you know what? Granted, you know I I have been putting up fifty points in the past couple seasons. However, you know I'm I'm starting to put up a little bit more. So you you got to give me a little bit more than a guy like Jake Gensel got. And so I think. Six and a half would be a fair number to to pinpoint for a guy like Matthew Kachuk right now. Now, whether he gets the full eight years, you know that he might be looking for. Whether they try to say, "Hey, let's let's make it short. Let's do you know a, a bridge deal nowadays," which you rarely ever see. But um, yeah, that that one I'm a little bit unsure about myself. Yeah, I could I could see Kachuk's camp going. I mean, you know, we we really we if we do this again. 
you know, where for, I mean, he's got 57 points right now, and over the course of 82 games, you know, you're looking at pretty much another another 36, 37 points if he were to continue this pace. So you're talking a, a guy who has 90 plus points. <laughs> so at 90 plus points, I mean, you're you're really in the elite. You're you're not you're not talking six and a half million. I mean, you're talking seven and a half, eight. You're you're pushing it up there, especially since he's not playing with Goudreau and Monahan. I, I know, yeah, I know on the power play, but I mean, we're when it comes to five on five, you know, that's that's where Lindholm's getting that, and so he's driving his own line, and right. uh, and I just I think that he he could probably be a guy I could see. You know, I'm not saying personality wise. I don't know. I don't know anything about him off the ice. I could see him going. I should be paid like Marner should be paid or like a Braden Point should be paid. I, I, he may be more along the lines of a Braden Point where he uh, – I know he's not a center, but he kind of, I think, has – there's there's a different vibe about him. You're not looking at him just going, okay, yeah, you're going to score a lot of points, mm-hmm. you know, what you were saying before. So I, I think there's a chance that he pushes that seven – I don't see eight quite yet for him. But if he did a bridge deal, you know, maybe you just go. Oh, I'll take my chances on a on a three year deal and uh, and really shoot for the payday uh, later on. Who who knows what what he ends up doing? Although a player like that, to me, you should be shooting for eight years, and because of the way you play, just just get get your money because you never know when you're going to get hurt playing a little bit more intense style of hockey. Yeah, that's 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 fair to say. Uh, shall we do some of Sebastian Ajo out in Carolina? Ooh, let's go. Who uh, the owner very much likes Sebastian Ajo. I think at one point it was everyone's available except for Sebastian Ajo. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fair to say. He is to me the forward that stirs this this drink in Carolina right now. I think um, you know you might see Smeshnikov be that guy in a couple years or be you know the bigger offensive powerhouse they were hoping he could be. But for right now. Right now in Carolina, it's Sebastian Ajo. Yeah, so, I mean, Sebastian Ajo right now, 54 points in 48 games on, on a very similar pace to a, to a Kachuk. Uh, he's, he's different, though, because he really is this team. So my question with, with Ajo, and I, new ownership, so and we, we haven't really seen them have to re-sign somebody of significance in in a, in a long time. I would say. I mean, they did just sign re-sign uh, Tuvo Teravainen. I I think it was today or yesterday. Yeah. Uh, yep. To uh to a five year deal at four point five point four. So we know Ajo is getting more than five point four, <laughs> which, which <laughs> yeah. we knew before that, anyways. Uh, right now, the highest paid player on this team is Dougie Hamilton at five seven five, and then second is Jacob Slavin. So I think he's definitely going to take the cake. I'm just wondering if he's going to go and, and and say, "Look, like I'm I'm the best player on this team, and uh, I'm the highest scored player scoring player on this team, and so I deserve, you know, that similar type of high end minimum eight million dollars for a player of my caliber." And and since the players I'm playing with aren't as good as, let's say, a Kachuk or a Marner. Braden Point, Rantanen, like I should maybe get as much as them because it, let's face it, if I was playing with John Tavares or McKinnon, I'd be putting up seventy points too in in forty five and forty eight games. So yeah. I, I wonder if there's going to be he's going to get overpaid because of uh, because of some of that 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 you set yourself up for future hurts because you go and you you feel the need to sign Aho to nine and a half million yeah and i think i think the biggest you know leverage i think that he actually has right now is the fact that this team is desperate to get in the playoffs right they've been trying for so long they've been sitting on the bubble for the last few seasons they just can't get over that hump and i think if you you know if you i don't want to say lose a guy but if you you know don't get him for the dollar amount that he thinks he deserves or if you somehow you know i you know, piss him off to where he's like, all right, well, just trade me at this point. You know, I don't want to be here anymore. You know, you, you're taking steps back that, you know, management and the ownership doesn't want to do. So I think you're going to see a guy, like you said, get overpaid a little bit uh, just to keep, you know, keep the team happy and keep them going in the right direction. 
Yep, I would agree. I think I think out of anybody on this list, he has the greatest risk to be overpaid. Yeah, and eight million dollars would not shock me at all if we see an eight and eight and eight for him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's let's drop down. I know Austin Matthews is the only the uh, what the seventh highest scorer on this on this uh, grouping, but he only has played thirty four games. Still has forty two <laughs> points. Pretty ridiculous. Uh, skip over. We'll skip over Timo Meyer. I think uh, we'll we'll come back to him and, and kind of talk about him in a in a more broader sense. But Austin Matthews, just throw it at him. what what number do you think he ends up at uh, with them negotiating right now? Things going well. Blah blah blah. What else are you going to say? Are you going to come out and say, "Oh, we hate him"? No, but yeah, no. Uh, uh, where do you think he he kind of ends up, uh, especially in in terms of you know before it was like, okay, Matthews and and Line A are the the cream of the crop for this RFA class, and then this year has the way that it's played out, scoring is up. So not only do you have to almost like. Do you need to take the increase in scoring across the league into account and say, well, you know, you were, despite scoring, let's say, 20 more points on average this year compared to the to last year, in, in reality, the percentage of points that you had or, you know, you can figure out, you know, how many how many goals you were a part of. The percentage is still very similar. It's just goal scoring was up in general. So it's not like a guy gets 90 points this year. It's it's definitely not the same as when a guy got 90 points three years ago when we saw only four players uh, be at a point per game. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I think, I think in the next year or two, you're going to really start to see that sort of level. Of, the playing field is going to level itself out where guys, like you said, scoring 90 points aren't going to get as much as they would have a few years ago now. Uh, when we talk about Austin Matthews, I I think the the number right now in my head is the same as John Tavares. I think that's eleven million dollars. Yeah, I think that that would be that would be fair. I think you yeah. look at that and you go, "Yep, pay him, pay your top two centers the same amount and call it a day." Yeah. Uh, at the same time, I could see saying, "Look, John was an, a UFA, and he's he's you know he's given us this is his his cash in." Uh, we need to get you at 10 or 10, you know, maybe, maybe he's willing to go to go a li- give a little bit of a discount like John Tavares was willing to do. I mean, you know, we, we know, I think it was the San Jose sharks offered him 13. So, I mean, he took a discount. Can you convince Austin Matthews take nine and a half convince Marner take eight, you know, or, or also both of you take nine or something like that. Uh, so that we can, bring in a defenseman so you guys can win the cup yeah and i i think that's going to be the only argument toronto really has is saying hey we need some cap space so we can bring in a number another you know top four defenseman so we can make this thing legit and make a run yeah yeah it'll be interesting to see what that number is i i think that once his contract is solidified everyone else is going to slot below yeah uh uh let's let's go let's just one more uh, specific one. I want a Patrick Line, who's had kind of a, he's really the one on here who's had a down year, uh, whereas all these other guys, you know, have blown us out of the water. Even if, you know, okay, Marner, yeah, you, you knew he was going to be good. Randon, you knew he was going to be good, but not 73 points in 49 games good. And so uh, I'm wondering what happens with Patrick Line. Do we see maybe a a bridge deal here? because of Ooh. the way that this season has played out for him or is it is this just going to go well yeah i mean he had kind of a weird year but we expect him to be fine and so therefore we're going to pay him pretty much what we would have paid him anyways yeah i i think pretty much the latter there they're going to pay him what they pretty much expected to because um let's let's face it to find pure goal scorers like this are they're very hard to come by right you don't see a ton of them guys who you know can go out there and put up 35 plus goals every season and I think he's one of the few guys in the NHL where you look at and you say hey he's going to put up some goals Um, now I think you know his argument you know or maybe Winnipeg's argument is going to be hey you know let's save a couple bucks here so we can find you a center right and then his numbers go up and then maybe that's where if you're Patrick Line you say hey let's let's get the bridge deal done 
that way they can go out and find a center. I'll blow my numbers through the roof when I get a good center to play with, and then they're really going to have to pay me. Yeah, or is it just Blake Wheeler is going to get eight two five? Well, he he's he'll next year he'll make eight two five with his contract extension, and and uh, we're going to pay Patrick Line just under that. We'll pay you eight because look, you scored. Uh, you know, by the by the end of this season, right now he's he's still on pace for about forty goals, uh, but only twenty like barely twenty assists. So do you look yeah. at that and go, you know, you just don't have the same kind of impact yet. So, you know, we'll sign you for, for eight and, you know, you can choose the amount of years and maybe he doesn't want to do eight, eight by eight, but he's willing to sign a, like an eight by six or an eight by five or something like that to, to, cause I, I think that if he was, if he did a five year deal, that would put him in unrestricted free agent. At five. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and, and another thing you got to look at too for this team, right, is they, they also have Kyle Connor coming up as an RFA. And Jacob and Truba. So, <laughs> right. And so both these guys, I think, are going to be sort of, you're going to have to look at, you know, line A as the starting point, right? What we give him, you know, obviously now you got to pay Kyle Connor a little bit less, even though his point production really isn't that far removed from Patrick Lining's. Um, and then Jacob Truba, of course, he's, he's a whole other bag because, you know, honestly, he's. He's really their future number one defenseman uh, because, let's face it, I don't think, uh, you know, Bufflin's got too many more good years left in him. And uh, certainly I think, you know, Morrissey maybe has made a case for being a, you know, a future star defenseman. But for right now, it's looking like Jacob Truba is the future of that defense. Between Jacob Truba, Patrick Laine, and Kyle Connor, they have $23 million under the cap next year at this point. Can they get all three of those players signed for less than twenty three million a year? Oh, yeah, I, I would think so. I think, I think a Kyle Connor you could probably do around six million, and you can maybe get him locked up for four or five years. Um, Patrick Liney a little bit more, and I think Jacob Truba right around that, you know, seven eight million dollar mark as well. But. I think so, so with those numbers, you're at 22 million. So you've got another million, and then you just lost Tyler Myers to unrestricted free agency. Yeah, I, I think that's going to be the issue here. I think maybe, you know, if you're Winnipeg, you're you're going to try to move Kulikov this off season. See if you can't find somebody to take his deal, so that maybe you can have a shot at keeping a Tyler Myers. Yeah, not to mention that uh, Josh Morrissey, his contract comes up at the end of next year. Yeah, uh, this team has some interesting. Uh, things to to work out for sure uh, let's any other names you, we you know i'd like to let's just hit william carlson and brock besser and then uh and and timo meyer those three uh say whatever you whatever you'd like about about those three guys i think those are those kind of round out the next class after that you've got a you've got like kesperi kapanen kevin fiala guys who are kind of more secondary type of players on their teams uh Brock Besser's interesting 37 games he has 33 points so he's uh he's just played a lot less games than other guys Timo Meyer almost averaging a point per game 44 and 48 and uh William Carlson not quite on his his uh 42 goal pace that he was on last year looks like he could he might end up with with 30 um which is probably what he more likely what he is a 30 goal scorer he's making 5.2 right now uh, any thoughts on where these guys end up? Yeah, I think a William Carlson, I think you're going to look at uh, Paul Stasny's deal as kind of a, uh, you know, a, a starting point for him. I think seven to seven and a half million seems about fair. I think William Carlson is going to want to be the highest paid player for the, the Golden Knights after what he did last year. And I think, you know, 30 goals isn't out of the realm for a guy like that. And I think he'll, he'll get paid accordingly. Yeah. And, uh, when it when it comes to Brock Besser in Vancouver, uh, Vancouver doesn't really have this core group of players signed long term. I mean, I guess you could say maybe Bo Horvat is a part of that group, but I mean Louis Erickson is their highest paid player right now, and obviously he's not a core guy. And uh, <laughs> then then you just kind of have some random random play. You know, you've got Horvat. You've got your Brandon Suter signed for another two years after this year. Sven Barchi, Antoine Roussel, and, and your Jay Beagle. Uh, but really, this team is 
I mean, this is this is the first year. You I mean you got to figure out what to do with Brock Besser because everything else is going to need to fall into place behind him. You know that Elias Peterson, when his deal comes up in three years, he'll of course break the bank for the for the Canucks. Um, you're not super worried about that yet, but. I mean, you, you've got to think that Brock Besser is going to be the one who maybe sets the standard for everyone else outside of Elias Peterson uh, coming off their deals. Yeah, I'll be honest. I think, you know, I think Vancouver gets very lucky. I think they probably wrap him up somewhere long term, eight years, like we talked about, at maybe six and a half million dollars. Wow. Uh, yeah. I mean, if they got him that cheap, that would be that would be so I don't see him getting less than. Oh, do I see him getting less than Nylander? Maybe I see him doing a bridge deal, but I can't see them wanting to do a bridge deal with him because they will want to get him under a cost-controlled salary so that when Peterson does come up, that he's not even an afterthought. Like, you don't want to sign him to do a two-year deal so that you have to sign both of them of the same offseason, and then you've got a, a Maple Leafs problem like a Marner or a Matthews. All right. <laughs> uh, any, any Timo Meyer thoughts? Uh, uh, you know what? I, this guy, I mean, his production has been all right the last uh, his last season. I think last year he had what thirty six points in eighty one games. So really, this is this is his big coming out party. So I don't think you're going to see him break the bank. Um, honestly, looking at their cap situation too, they are a team that's pretty close up to the cap, and it's they're not going to get a ton of relief outside of you know Joe Pavelski. They're going to need to resign him, and I think he might be right where he's at, or might get. You know, uh, maybe get seven, but uh, with Thornton's five coming off the books, uh, you know, they also got to think about Eric Carlson. You know, are they going to pay him out? So um, yeah. I think yeah, all these factors are going to come into play. Dowdy hmm? money, right? Carlson's got to yeah. get Dowdy money. Oh, without a doubt, yeah. So I, I think given all that, I mean, Timo Meyer, I think if anybody Four. is primed for a bridge deal as well, I think it wouldn't shock me to see him get two or three years at, you know, maybe five, five and a half or somewhere around that mark. Okay, uh, let's let's move on to uh, defensemen here. Uh, there are some some pretty solid defensemen. Uh, not not a ton, but uh, you've got Essa Lindell in Dallas. Of course, Jacob Truba. We've kind of already hit on him. Uh, Cody Cece in Ottawa. Will Butcher in New Jersey. Uh, not guys putting up monster points, but then you come around to Zach Wierenski, who uh, is probably going to hit the biggest payday out of anyone in this crew, along with uh, Charlie McAvoy, who. Uh, it's funny to see his name written out as Charles McAvoy, but uh, <laughs> on the list that I have, that's how he's written out. Uh, but, of course, he, he was hurt earlier on in the season. He only has one goal this year. Uh, maybe that injury hurts him a little bit. Where where do you think uh, a Wierenski and a McAvoy end up in terms of uh, their team's salary structure? Oh, this is going to be tough, and I think – you know, I think for one thing, Wierenski's proven that he's he's worth whatever, you know, he's almost worth a blank check, I think, at this point for Columbus. Not necessarily that he's going to get, you know, over $10 million or anything like that, but, um, you know, they don't have a lot of, um, boy, they don't have a lot of big point producers on this team. They got guys that, it almost seems like kind of a Nashville situation, right, where they've got a bunch of guys that, you know, aren't producing big numbers, but yet they still seem to go out there and get it done. Um but I think for Warinsky, you know, we've seen the emergence of Seth Jones, and I think both those guys would like to like to skate next to each other for a few more years. Um, I mean, let's be let's be honest. Seth Jones at five point four is is quite the steal. Yep. Uh, I, I honestly could see Warinsky getting somewhere in the neighborhood of eight million dollars. Yeah, I think he is he is going to get something similar to uh, maybe a Brent Burns. Uh, I know Brent Burns signed his contract a couple years ago uh, but he does play that more you know a little bit higher point producer uh, although I'd say that Wierenski is better defensively obviously as an RFA it's hard to maybe compare the contracts themselves but uh, but a similar number I think he gets eight eight a year uh, I think I think that you could see something like that I, but you know I could also see Wierenski taking us or coming in a little bit less because when Seth Jones was hurt or Rensky didn't look near, he wasn't nearly as effective. And so, uh, it kind of makes you wonder how good is Seth Wierenski or 
or <laughs> Zach Wierenski, and how <laughs> good is really Seth Jones? Like, is Seth Jones just that stinking good that he's made a a really good defenseman look like he's one of the best? Right, and I mean that's that's fair to say for sure. And then I think looking the other side of the coin too, when you look at uh, a guy like Charlie McAvoy, right? And we want to talk about him. This is a guy who his biggest leverage point is going to be the future of the Boston Bruins defense, right? Big Z's, you know, he's 41 years old, turning 42 soon. Uh, I think outside of Tory Krug, you know, he is the other big defenseman that's going to be eating up the minutes for this team in the next few seasons. So, um, you know, why Charlie McAvoy hasn't had the same type of production like Warinsky has in seasons past. Um, you know, I, I could see, again, this is a guy I could see on a bridge deal because, um, you know, he's only had one full season in this league. Now in his second season, I think that, you know, maybe a two, three-year deal at around $6 million wouldn't surprise me. Okay. Uh, any other defensemen that catch your eye? I mean, I guess Ivan Provorov, uh, despite not putting – he's not a big point guy, but, uh, of course, you know, big things expected from him in Philadelphia, but uh, maybe hasn't quite yet arrived. Um, another bridge deal for him and for Travis Sanheim, do you think? Yeah, I think that's fair, and I think uh, a, a good number for a guy like maybe Provorov would be to look at Shane fear. You know, you might want to get him around that four and a half, five mil for a bridge deal for him while they, they try to figure out, you know, what he's going to be, I guess. Yeah, and I mean, he's he's younger than Gossespierre was when he signed his deal, and so uh, you're not going to be buying out any UFA years like they did with Gossespierre, but... Uh, yeah, I, I think that it's fair to say somewhere around the $5 million mark for Provorov and for Sanheim. Uh, but you may, you know, there's you might look and, and say, well, you know, really I'm your best defenseman. So I, I should be paid far more than Gossespierre. Gossespierre is kind of, I want to say, you know, when he was, when he signed this deal, it seemed like he was, almost touted as this, like, he's the most athletic defenseman in the National Hockey League. Like, the way that he played, I just remember seeing him dive across the blue line and knock the puck down so that it wasn't iced on a, on a power play. I, I've right. never seen anyone do that before. And I was like, man, this guy is, like, your, your next wave of athleticism at this position. And he kind of just came back down to earth, and he's still he's still a nice player. Uh, but I, I don't think that he's as otherworldly as maybe he, he appeared to be early on in his career. Uh, whereas I think that Ivan Provorov is a much more solid defenseman. He he tends to be able to uh, to like you know shut down the other team's forwards when he's on the ice. So uh, it, it would you know it'd be nice if he had someone to play with. But uh, you know <laughs> Andrew McDonald or Rad Radko Gudis that's is what it is and why the Flyers are in last place in the league. And maybe the Flyers use that too and they say, I mean, we we finished last in the league. I mean, it's really hard to evaluate how well you did when we were so bad and so, yeah, let's do a bridge deal. So, yeah. we'll, uh, Or maybe let's save some money so we can go out and get us a uh, free agent to bring in. They, yeah, they only have $31 million in cap <laughs> space for next year. That doesn't include any increase. So they're they're obviously not struggling too bad. Probably because they're struggling really bad. Uh, wow. Let's. Uh, there's. There's only a couple goalies I think worth talking about in this class. Uh, David Riddich is is the one guy who I think will uh, will you know, actually get paid here. Uh, but moving forward, is he is he Calgary's number one goalie, and and that's that. And Mike Smith doesn't come back next year. Um, but do they kind of try and and hold on to this one A one B so that he can continue to develop? Is this his net, and does he get paid the same way? You know, I, I'm this this team's goaltending tandem is is maybe the most interesting moving forward because of you know two guys playing well and one young one old and it's kind of the way that it's supposed to be. You know, one guy passes the torch, but the older guy's playing great as well. So it's maybe hard to nail down what what do you think that he'll uh what do you think they're going to do here yeah you know i think with the emergence of riddich this season i think you're going to see mike smith gone after this year they're not going to resign him however what i do think because this has really been the only good year for him in the nhl in terms of you know coming in and showing he can be a potential number one goaltender 
you're going to see them go out and probably sign him to not such a lucrative deal, but maybe like a three-year contract at maybe four, four and a half million dollars. Oh, so you mean Koskinen <laughs> with <Yeah>. the Oilers, right? <laughs> right. And then I, I think you'll see them go out and maybe spend some money again, maybe another $4 million on another goaltender, uh, depending on their cap situation. Again, too, this is all, you know, dependent on what other guys sign well, they, for, like we got, talked about earlier. They've got $12 million available to them next year. So if we assume okay. safely assume that seven to eight of that is Matthew Kachuk, uh, we're running out of money real quick. Right, right. So, and again, too, I, I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't shock me if they get him on a lower lower deal you know like i said four million dollars maybe even three and a half million dollars for a couple seasons to go out and and bring in another goaltender maybe like a Semyon varlarmov or somebody at another you well, know three million dollar cap hit is it out of the realm of possibility to think that mike smith could come back on a on a one-year deal at at two and a half take a pay no. cut knowing that you're the you're going to be the backup i mean he's he's next year he's not going to go and be a starter anywhere i mean he He's, no, I think Mike Smith at this point in his career is pretty much going to play the Ryan Miller role now. Sure, where he's sure. going to go be a backup somewhere, and I, I just don't think it's in Calgary. I, I think you know they don't, not necessarily don't want him, but I think right now they're they're going to try to separate themselves, move on, and go let him do his thing somewhere else, and maybe challenge because I think right now at this point they're they're probably done with Mike Smith. Okay, all right. Well, we will uh, certainly find out. I guess in the, in the off season. Uh, <laughs> lots of hockey before that ever comes. We don't have to say those bad words off season. Those are those are uh, banned words here. Yeah. Uh, well, that is our show. You know, let us know what you uh, what you think about our predictions for these RFAs. Uh, I will uh, I will be getting up in five hours to go in and have my knee ripped into, and uh, you know, hopefully they they put things in and don't rip the rest of it out. But, uh, yeah, uh, hit us up at OT Hockey Talk on Twitter. And, Justin, any any last words? Uh, boy, have fun tomorrow. Oh, geez, thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, we will, uh, we'll be back next week with, uh, with more shows as, uh, you know, I just need a few, a few uh, to recover from my surgery. So, <laughs> so uh, just, just hang with us, and we will talk to you next week. Thanks for listening.